Our next speaker is Dr. George Palagian. He's going to speak about mus musculoskeletal disorders among construction workers. He's an occupational medicine physician in the Irving Selikoff Center for Occupational and Environmental Medicine and an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Preventive Medicine at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. Um, his primary interests are, I think, really interesting. Um, he has worked with the upper extremities developed in treating people who are working on sewing machines and also um, with biomechanical forces that injure musicians. So we're kind of switching gears here a bit. He's also taught environmental health here at the American University of Armenia as a visiting faculty member. Dr. Palogian. Thank you very much. This is my third time in Armenia, actually. All two times before were again at the AUA. But this time, uh, it's not for teaching purposes solely, but hopefully for projects that will make a difference in implementing um, changes. Uh, one is to study them in an the, the academic setting, but the other is to uh, make a difference in what is uh, done in real life and uh, to diminish exposures, and that's a challenge. It's easier to talk uh, from slides and, and books, but uh, to implement what we've talked about, that's the real challenge. And um, so uh, my talk will be not on upper extremities because construction workers, although they do have upper extremity injuries, um, I, I will talk more. Uh, that The type of work that I do every day is in a larger city where construction is part of the type of patients we see, but also sedentary work. And sedentary work can also injure, but in a different way. And uh, construction workers have one advantage because they are at least moving. And um, sedentary workers are not even fit for the job that they are doing. And being sedentary is a risk factor. In fact, we saw uh, Dr. Kurt Streif uh, have that on the list of the IARC as a possible carcinogen just being sedentary. Uh, we know that sedentariness is being increasingly uh, talked about as a risk factor for all cause mortality. So uh, with that in mind, you should not all be sitting down. We should be taking breaks, but <laughs> that's not always feasible. Uh, but I will go on with what I have been asked to talk about. And already Dr. Um, England uh, has uh, uh, spoken about some of the ergonomic issues. And um, I will be uh, talking a little bit uh, on a different track. Uh, you'll see, because uh, first it's one of the later uh, topics and I want everyone to stay awake. And uh, also statistics are, are very important. Knowledge is what we base everything we do. But uh, again, we are human beings and why we will act upon information has to do with what motivates us. And uh, we are people of creatures, I should say, of meaning. And so I do want to bring some of that uh, issue of uh, what happens when a construction worker is injured uh, into the story of that you will see. Uh, remember, I'm talking about musculoskeletal, but it is not uh, exclusively musculoskeletal that construction workers suffer. They are breathing in, and their skin is in contact with a number of different substances. So um, I'm going to this uh, top, this talk was constructed, in fact, by uh, me along with slides that I took directly from Lori Welch at the Center for uh, to Protect Workers' Rights, uh, uh, and uh, also Scott Schneider at the uh, North American Laborers um, Association, uh, Hemant Siren, who's a resident. I, uh, I pulled into the uh, practice to, to do some slides for me, the first five or six, and the PowerPoint uh, assistance I got from Lori Linker at our uh, own facility. Uh, now, in the U.S., uh, about 30 percent of workers, uh, we just spoke about that. Uh, Carol also mentioned that, and, uh, we, and so did Dr. England, uh, that we do not uh, have good reporting. Uh, that's an estimate in the United States, because if the state uh, or the government does not keep mandatory numbers, then you will have underreporting because you want the appearance that everything is going well. Uh, in reality, that's not true. Um, and of course, as a doctor who sees injured patients, uh, I find that 
they may not have reported the injury uh, or that they are undocumented. And in the United States, and uh, we have many undocumented uh, workers. Uh, so when they have injuries, nobody captures that information, but they are at least eligible for workers' compensation, even if they have not received citizenship or cannot get social security disability or private disability. And um, I as imagine that, uh, of course, under-reporting is more a problem in other countries as well, uh, such as Armenia. Um, now, the employer has an important part to play because if the employer um, feels that it is important to have health and safety, and we heard that uh, from our colleague in uh, Sweden, um, that if the employer, if the head of the uh, construction believes that it is important to safeguard their workers, you have a much better chance that all the employees will be well taken care of. So it's very important as to what the employer or the manager values. If they value health and safety, then the workers have a much better chance of uh, actually working in a safe workplace. And this has been written about in the study that is cited in this slide. Now, emergency room reported musculoskeletal injury rates in the construction industry. That's one way to get an idea of what is happening. Uh, how do you know if the government doesn't keep uh, statistics, they're underreported, um, if people are undocumented, if they do not go to seek medical care in and the doc I mean to say if the doctor whom they are seeing for treatment does not know that they have to report this, then it will be treated and nobody will know that it had an occupational origin. But in emergency rooms, um, they will try to at least take a history of how the injury occurred. They may not ask the occupation in a doctor's office uh, because the doctor may not know what to do with that information. But in an emergency room, they will typically ask, how did it occur? So if they say it occurred in a construction, then we go back and look at emergency room uh, rates. And uh, as you can see, uh, the proportion of uh, total uh, injuries uh, that happen um, in the construction industry uh, from 98 to 2005 is uh, reported in this one uh, American Journal of Industrial Medicine article in 2010. And surprisingly, um, sprains or strains are among the largest uh, percentage of injuries, which means overexertion. Uh, not necessarily that something falls on you or that you fall on something or you get a cut, but that you are uh, overexerting. Uh, you've lifted something heavy, you've worked in an awkward position and you get an injury that occurs over time. This is not a one-time accident, it is happening over time and that is the type of injury I, sp I specifically deal with, although, uh, of course, many people get injured on a one-time accident, they fall, uh, others develop the injury over time, and this is important. And uh, if we look here at the rate uh, of the injury, uh, the age in years, uh, you can see that the greatest uh, uh, rate of injuries, in other words, the, the per new occurrences is in the 25 to 34 uh, year um, range of the age group. Uh, that is expected. It's uh, um, not as many in the older groups. You would think perhaps that as they get older, they would uh, be more susceptible and uh, perhaps they also have left the workforce by that time, those who are injured, or uh, they work more carefully as they are older. But the, this is the age group that has the larger proportion. Uh, the uh, also below you can see Hispanic versus non-Hispanic and you can see um, the rates of injury uh, as well and that's uh, responding to a question that was asked. Uh, the next slide I think is going to show uh, a little bit more of that uh, specifically. No, it's the one after. Uh, what here we are seeing again is in the types of injuries that people are sustaining. Uh, it's, it's, I think you can read that and it's uh, self-explanatory. In the top you can see, um, excuse me, uh, let me see the top one. The 
accidents that we most uh, frequently hear about, co contacts with an object, something falls on you or you fall on it, is still the highest proportion. Uh, and there is a lot on this slide that I would like to talk about, but the truth is it's been, um, the, the, the long, the, the short version is that construction causes injuries, both contact and overexertion, and both non-white, both and white inj uh, p persons are injured. In other words, there are high rates of injuries um, in all of the trade, but it's even more in uh, the Hispanic workers because uh, there are barriers to their understanding the rules, barriers to their reporting injuries, and this has been uh, talked about. It's not the focus of what my talk is, but it's worth understanding because someone asked a question, and America has a large migrant labor force. Uh, I mentioned migrant worker because uh, actually, uh, as we'll see later, um, the uh, Ramazzini uh, Collegium in 2010, I believe, uh, issued a, uh, a paper on uh, migrant work. And it's very interesting because, uh, as we'll see, about a large proportion of migrant workers are employed in seasonal employment. And seasonal employment, a large proportion of that type of employment is construction. So migrant worker and construction work uh, are closely related. And that's uh, an, a topic uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit more in detail. Uh, here we see that construction industry, uh, as compared below to transportation and agriculture, has the uh, highest percentage of fatalities uh, in the state by state. And we look at different states where uh, you have foreign-born people, uh, uh, which is higher in California. You see the second uh, row, 71%. Um, so it is increased among foreign-born people, the fatalities, even more so than the uh, injuries that take time to occur. So fatality rates are higher among uh, non-white uh, migrant labor in the United States, as would be expected. And although I'm not focusing on that, I didn't mean uh, to be go into those slides, I, I couldn't help but make that point because later I'm going to be making the larger point of migrant workers. Um, and again, this is fatalities. It's not musculoskeletal, but it has to be mentioned. Uh, the number of uh, work-related injury deaths of Hispanic workers, to answer your question, compared with rate for all workers. And here you can see um, clearly that it is higher um, basically throughout the years that it was measured from 92, except for one year in 95, uh, till 2006. And uh, this is, you can see that that rate is not going down, whereas for other um, non-Hispanic workers, it seems to at least plateau. Um, so this is to be imagined, but the statistics uh, bear it as well. Now, the injury rates, as opposed to fatalities, uh, in the construction industry in another country, uh, Switzerland, uh, you can see here, um, this is a busy slide, and I don't want to talk too much about it, but again, the age group, and start with the very bottom, uh, the age group where you have the most injuries is, uh, again, about 30, uh, 30 years old, um, and, and 30, 39, so it's also true in the United States. Um, then as we go further up in table four, uh, the regions that are injured, uh, as expected, you will see uh, the extremities. Um, and then after that, the, the rest of the body, including the head and neck. So the extremities are often uh, injured, uh, which is not a surprise, of course. <laughs> the frequency of the diagnoses, uh, as you can see, you have the sprain and strain uh, still about evenly divided, uh, whereas fractures uh, and abrasions are still a little bit higher. But the, the point I want to make is that sprain and strain um, injuries or stretching over exertion is an important part of how construction workers get injured. And finally, the causes uh, you have is uh, non, uh, where is the state? The unspecified, that is probably over stretching. It is in the non-specified area, whereas 
uh, if you can identify a piece of equipment, uh, a movable object, a stationary object, those are in the 20 percentage, but uh, almost 20 percent of unspecified, which would uh, probably be the overuse type. Now the risk factors. This is uh, something you've just briefly seen earlier, and uh, we're going to talk about them. Again, there is um, a lack, really, of data. This is the problem. And uh, there is, of course, reason to under-report, even more so in the United States. Government standards are needed because the migrant workforce comprises a lot of the construction workers. And if you are, do not make mandatory reporting a government uh, job, then the private sector has less incentive to do so. And doctors who see patients may not know that they have an occupational origin, especially if it's the overexertion type and they do not ask the basic occupational history. We usually get occupational uh, as part of the insurance to make sure that the patient can pay, but nobody links that with what they actually do, which would be useful. And with our new uh, healthcare system of Obamacare, uh, they are trying, uh, occupational specialists have sent requests to have at least a minimum of occupation included as a mandatory aspect of the plan. Whether it will or will not be, we will find out. But the request was made. It was a petition. Uh, now, we all know that education is needed, especially entry level where you have uh, high rates of injuries and uh, where workers are more impressionable. Uh, when you start, this is where you are expected to understand what is your responsibility, and that's where you need to do the educating. Um, you have higher rate of musculoskeletal disorders among construction workers compared to others. This has been said before by uh, speakers. Sprain and strain injuries, about 30% of all injuries, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2012, and are uh, about 44 per 10,000 full-time workers, which is higher than all private sector workers. Now, there is a hierarchy according to the ANSI standard on preventing musculoskeletal problems in construction, and as we've heard, the first is to eliminate the problem if you can. Second, to substitute. Third, to use engineering controls to find a better way to do this, uh, to make administrative changes. For instance, we will not work uh, 12 hours, you will take breaks so that you're not tired and you can lift without incurring an injury. Athletes know this. If you are running too many races, you, this is when the athletes get injured. The same thing in construction work. If you are working too many hours, uh, you have more chance of getting injured because your muscles are fatigued. Uh, that's an example of uh, administrative and a work practice change. Uh, work practice can also mean using two people to lift brick. Uh, and training means telling somebody that this is how you prevent the injury. Ask for someone to help you lift. Or if you don't have a scaffolding available, uh, you may try and construct one. Uh, so protective equipment is also part of it, this. Uh, wearing back braces may provide uh, some support. Uh, I don't know the literature on how effective this is, but certainly it's prevalent. Um, also, the contact injuries can be prevented by wearing uh, proper insulation just as football players know this. Um, and finally, assess physical capabilities. You know, if you look at the workforce in, in Armenia and you look, uh, thank you for walking because this is important. If you look at the workforce in Armenia and you see someone who is very thin and doesn't have a lot of muscle and is working on a construction site, you can imagine that this person may become injured more readily. And uh, in sports and in other uh, endeavors, we do look at physical capabilities of who's doing work, but this needs to be uh, implemented in construction work as well. Here are some pictures. Uh, they are um, showing, well, I can talk about a lot about them, but I don't want to uh, do that because uh, there are other slides I'd like to get to. It's just to break uh, up the awkward posture, uh, working in uh, positions that can easily injure the neck and shoulders. Uh, they're not some work has to be done. This construction work is inherently dangerous. There are some 
things that you can minimize the risk, but you cannot eliminate that. And that's a very important part of uh, understanding the topic. You're not going to eliminate all of the risks. You can get rid of asbestos, but even there we saw that the uh, substitutes have their own risks as well. And more so in doing uh, inherently dangerous, physically demanding work. We understand people will become injured. And that does not mean you do not try to stop the injuries. It means that you recognize that people may become disabled. And in fact, that is the, uh, the ending theme uh, here. This is showing you the weight of construction blocks that uh, people do not always have lifts to carry them, that they cannot fit wheel devices into small construction sites and have to carry these on their shoulders. You can imagine why the extremities are injured. Now, the social and economic impact, which is what I'd like to finish with, um, comes from a, some work done by Laurie Welsh, uh, which I like that uh, study, actually. And it, it really says that what makes construction work different, Dr. Englund had talked about that, uh, the work changes. It's not in the same place. It changes, and therefore what you c would do in one setting, you cannot carry with you into every setting. One will be up in a mountain, one will be a down in a valley, one will be in a building. In, in Armenia, most of the construction that's occurring now is residential, as we noticed, uh, apartments and buildings, as opposed to government-run uh, work. And actually, one of the AUA uh, professors, uh, Alan Amarkhanian, had done a study on the economics of construction industry. Um, they are construction workers less likely to have health insurance than manufacturing workers. Uh, they are itinerant workers. They take their trade where they go, and they have periods of unemployment. If there's no construction work, they're not doing uh, something on that day. They're unemployed part of the time. Um, and over 90% have 10 or fewer employees. So these are small groups. You cannot use large-scale economy of size. So this is why employers have difficulty implementing health and safety, because they're small businesses, in effect, with a migrant workforce very difficult to implement uh, standards. And yet, in some countries, it's done because the employers are mandated. But and, by the way, uh, the number, uh, doc, I know Denny will probably talk more about aging, but construction work is growing. As, as we, as the societies, move from rural to urban life, we will need to build more durable uh, edifices. And we will need more construction workers. And the, of course, the, as, the a, as the population ages, uh, we are going to have older workers. And so that is a topic that will be covered as well. 10% uh, of construction workers do not return to work after an acute injury. And of course, if you've been getting several acute injuries, next thing you know, you are disabled. And if you then have a non-musculoskeletal disease, such as a uh, respiratory problem, at that point, you are more likely to retire on disability than workers with the same condition in a less physically demanding work. Because now you have to use your lung capacity to do physically demanding work. Whereas if you had a disease in a sedentary job, you are not functioning at the same level. So construction workers have having a respiratory and musculoskeletal injuries have to generally retire, and their age of retirement is usually in the mid-50s. Uh, here in Germany, even, e and I'll give it a slide, two-thirds of construction workers retire on disability compared to 44% of workers in all industries combined. So there, it's even worse I, in uh, transition economies such as Armenia, I have no doubt, although I don't know if anyone has uh, done uh, the statistics. The identified risk factors, uh, I will not go because of time, because I want to uh, uh, show you here roofers, including uh, female roofers. Um, again, we saw the high rates of uh, injury, back injuries uh, among roofers, uh, and depending on the material they're working with, if it's being heated, if they put asphalt and bitumen on the roof, they will be exposed to uh, other hazards as well, carcinogens uh, uh, as well. So you have to realize that they have uh, musculoskeletal and a host of others, and we're going to uh, talk about that here. We have uh, uh, many. I, I can talk on each slide a whole lecture, so we won't do that. Um, this study, I'm, I'm not going to go over the specifics because I want to get to the uh, really the the uh, 
conclusion. They asked a questionnaire that was a standardized one that was looking at the social and economic impact of what happens after people are injured. And uh, in fact, 69% of the uh, people who were questioned, who were working, uh, had seen a physician for a chronic medical or musculoskeletal uh, condition in the prior two years. And 42% had a medical condition and 54% had a musculoskeletal and 42% had multiple. Now, this is the key, is that they have multiple injuries. And this then can disable a person. It is like a number of risk factors. If you have two or three, the, uh, the disability rates increase. It's a synergistic uh, process. And what is most prevalent in musculoskeletal is low back, as you can imagine. Then comes knees, lungs, and upper back and shoulders. This uh, mask is worthless. It looks like a paper dust mask. Um, and of course, th the vibration happening as they're sawing through uh, the tiles, which could uh, indeed contain asbestos, uh, are uh, examples of how you have vibration uh, as one risk factor, awkward posture, uh, weight, because this is excess force for this person. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the respiratory, all in one, uh, one stop shop. I, I don't want to go through this because of time issues. Uh, this says in pictorially what I said, that the more uh, disease you have, the more you are limited from work, and the earlier you retire uh, with a disability. And then when you have a disability, you have less ability to care for family. And if you do not have a social insurance net, your family will fall into poverty as well. This is something that is not often understood in terms of its impact. Um, and here we have just an idea of complaints. This is not even uh, measuring the, uh, the, the, the materials, but the complaints about vapors or gases uh, in different types of construction workers. Of course, the, as I said, the roofer that may use asphalt will have the vapor of asphalt, which is undeniable. Um, but then uh, we have the cement. We, I explained here th through this slide what it contains, that it's alkaline, and uh, I have to go on from here quickly, that uh, you have complaints about chemicals in different types of uh, work, also about dust, uh, maybe one about noise, but I think I skipped that. And uh, the last group of slides actually were historical because I wanted to add some history to this. And uh, with the quick permission of uh, uh, maybe 30 seconds, <laughs> I will tell you a, a quick story. <laughs> St um, I'm going to go to that uh, story. Really, uh, what I wanted to suggest, by the way, was that the, the perhaps the Ramazzini um, uh, colloquium here could uh, make a statement that besides uh, educating workers, we could develop vocational rehabilitation so that when they are injured, we have preferential hiring of local uh, employers of an injured construction worker to do something else. In other words, treat them as a preferential group so that at the age of 50 or 55, they can work as a security guard doing something and they do not have to then uh, have the whole family go into uh, uh, poverty, basically. And the story I was going to get to was of all the people who have had construction worker in their family, uh, Armenia, we know, is the first efficiency country. And there was research that has come out. Uh, you can read this here, but uh, you do know that Jesus' uh, earthly father was a carpenter. Turns out that the word for carpenter is tekton in Greek, which can mean working with a hard material, but also mean stonemason. And he may not have just been employed in his little village because he was very close to a large city that King Herod was building called Sepphoris. And Nazareth, by the way, was one of those communities where migrant workers lived, probably working in Sepphoris, which is why when Jesus was coming to one of his disciples and, and they introduced him as Jesus of Nazareth, Philip said, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? 
was not a town in which uh, well-to-do people lived or people who had a good reputation. And so um, it was uh, not far from Sephoris, which is what that showed. This is a picture of Sephoris modern day excavations. And uh, this is the view of Sephoris from Nazareth, which means a, a laborer could have walked there. And uh, it had very nice stone structures which are preserved till now. So a lot of stone masonry and construction work was going on there, including what's called the Mona Lisa of uh, Sephoris, uh, which is a mosaic of 23 different colors. Uh, the point being that uh, even Jesus knew what construction work was. That's how he chose to come onto this earth. And so those who think that construction workers may not have much interest, I think we should, that our cities, everything we're living in, this very auditorium is built by construction workers. I think it would be good to try to help them when they do become injured in terms of vocational rehabilitation. And that's uh, a theme that I'd like to say to you. And thank you for your attention today. Two quick questions. We'll try to keep them brief, please. Yep. Um, Katrina Zanam, Bibi College is an architect and a parishioner. In heart to Dartal, the Yadume, Eli Hamajara Kabanakan Masin, Uraman has Tanum Masanjika can have one to two Neri, Hetazo to Tuna, Vahus Nerdervats, Gorton Tatsen. Are you watch Barakichi Vans Neri Hamajara Kaban Tuna, Davakan Nor Gorton Tatsen? If Vercin Tarnerin is sell him Navervel, Hramash, a heart is Vera Bevme, Aveli, a head population, Hetazo to Tuneri. The center of Tesa graphic for Innocent Yerkut Vacani suits her talis to Vialner. Uzumem Hartsner, Innocent Yerkut Vacani, Tegorzel, a Hetazo to Tuneri Hamakar, Kate, retrospective Katarvel. Եվ արդյոք սա համակարգային, այսքն մշտադիտակում է, թե սա ասենք սղվերների միջոցով կատարվող հետազոտություն է, որ տվյալները ներկայացվեցին։ Well, I can answer that. Certainly, I started my residency training in 1990, and there are in place systemic uh, surveys that are done when a researcher decides to look at a question. This is uh, how academic research is done. You pick a population, you uh, often have to get funding, and you send out a questionnaire. You may then follow that up with a physical exam, and then people publish this, and others like myself read studies and then others come and look at multiple studies and make analyses and trends, and this is how the literature develops. Uh, sometimes uh, you will have a automatic a surveillance system in place by the government that looks at, at indicators, and again, uh, if they publish the trends, uh, someone in the ministry uh, has to sit and look at the data and do an analysis, and we do have some limited data that is uh, amenable to that type of analysis. But other times, you have to ask a specific question, and a researcher has to look at a specific population. Now, studies have been done uh, before 90s. Uh, we always used them because we want to see trends. That is why we pick a, a time like 92 to 2005, because we will make a storyline. We will see how the trends have changed from the 90s to the 70s when certain interventions were made. And some of these dates are arbitrary, but others have to do with the elimination of a certain risk factor, the introduction of new methods of uh, treatment for a disease, or another way of doing the same work. So it's a very fluid uh, condition, and there is no simple answer that uh, there is one way of monitoring all the time for every injury. You have to ask the question, and then you know how to look. Did that answer your question? Yes, it does. 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 
հիմա ինչ եւ շատ բարակ գաջի գաջով փակված են դա իրոք հիմա մեծ վնաս պիտի հասցնի հայ ազգին ինչ որ փոխելու կարիք կա թե ոչ այդ առաջինը երկրորդը Գոնե դրամ պատասխանի do not do anything that alters the surface. So if if it has been painted, leave the paint. Leave the whitewash. It can only help keep the fibers stuck down. Um th- but the better alternative is to remove it and bury it. And I'll just remind the audience that that most of us are here for the rest of the afternoon, so after the meeting adjourns officially, we'll be happy to try to field some questions individually. Just a clarification: the translation will be available on three on until three p.m. So we have ah, about moving right seven along. minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and our next speaker is is a dear friend, Denny Dobbin, who has forty five years of ex- experience as an occupational hygienist. He has been president of the Society for Occupational Environmental Health, and is the uh, chairman of our foundation, the Chair Graphics International Foundation as well as a member of the Blacksmith Institute Technical Advisory Board. He's also one of the co-organizers of this conference and is a Collegium Ramazzini Fellow. He's going to talk to us about getting old. So pay attention. Does, does anybody feel the need to stand up and after this uh, invigorating? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think sedentary work is wor- you know, play here, so we know that's a risk factor. I'm uh, I'm, I'm going to talk today about a, another risk factor, age. Uh, and, and this uh, uh, presentation is based on information from the U.S., from Europe. Uh, globally, it's not specific to Armenia, but I think there's many uh, ideas here that will apply. Uh, but I just wanted to be clear and apologize for not having uh, uh, sp- Armenian sp- specific information today about, about uh, your demographics. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the hosts and uh, Bardui and uh, her staff for the wonderful uh, support that they've uh, given us, uh, AUA for uh, their encouragement for this um, uh, particular symposium, uh, working with in partnership with the Collegium Ramazzini. Uh, and uh, I want to particularly thank the people of Armenia and all the people I've met uh, here for the friendliest, it's, it's very friendly folks here, and really thank you for that. So today, uh, it's uh, it's going to be a general talk about um, age and as a risk factor, uh, and it's uh, with some information about construction and, and how it applies to construction. You've already heard some age-related things from all the speakers uh, about uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 impact of age. Uh, Andres talked. In ter- the, remember the curve about. Uh, noise and that's age. Uh, if hearing loss is, uh, increases, uh, George spoke about age in several ways. And in one way, some of those slides look like age was a protection factor, but uh, it really isn't. I mean, it's. it's, it's I think it really r- r- shows survivors, you know, people who are at the end of who have survived or, and have learned through experience, of, of like the lower back and lifting and things like that. Uh, so those numbers are, are, uh, have to be carefully interpreted, I think, uh, because it looked like as you got older, it was better for your back. <laughs> but that is not the case at all. Oops. Yeah. 
So what I'm trying to do today and briefly is to talk about demographic changes that are affecting the global workforce uh, and then put this in the context of occupational safety and health policy. And it's, I, I see that there are a number of students in the room and I'm assuming that you're uh, in the health program and uh, I'm hoping that this helps direct some of your ideas about forming policy as we get into that kind of thing. Uh, and then finally to identify some research needs. Because as I looked around uh, in this particular uh, project, and I've been sort of interested in, in age as a, a factor for some time, uh, it, there's very little that's being done. There's a lot of policy interest in it, because in aging, because of the way our social uh, insurance uh, systems are set up. Because as uh, most of them have, in some way or another, have the uh, uh, younger workers supporting older workers as they retire and leave the workforce. So what's happening today, and I, I'll, I'll try to persuade you of, is that the uh, workforce is aging, so the proportion of older workers is growing in terms of the number of younger workers and that puts a tremendous amount of stress uh, on the uh, social service systems. First, we have to talk about a definition. How old is old? And uh, aging is a process, really. It really become, begins in a way before uh, birth. Uh, be, and then we age all the way through till death. But of course, we're talking about the upper end. We've heard already about young age and some childhood uh, 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 health protections. Uh, today, we're talking about the other end of the spectrum of, of uh, older workers. But what is an older worker? In the US Department of Labor, there's at least one place, uh, one uh, uh, group that says anything, anybody old, older than 40. Our American Association of Retired Persons, uh, not personnel, it's persons, uh, older citizens are over 50, and that's a target for them, and that's for their membership. Uh, the Office of Aging, which is a, a, a federal government uh, office in the U.S., talks about 55. The United Nations, over 60. Uh, and baby boomers, uh, by the definition of a baby boomer is be, uh, in the cohort between 46 and 64. So it, there's a lot of variation, and there is no standard uh, for this, uh, but I think it's useful, and, tr and, and, the, and I think even in the data that we've seen this afternoon, there have been different ways of grouping age uh, in five-year cohorts, 10-year cohorts. Uh, so we have to be careful about definitions. For purposes of today, for construction workers, I'd like to use 45. I think we've, we've and this is just by way of, of taking the place of, of a little bit younger, uh, and it could be 40 even, because older uh, construction workers, I think, and you've seen from this other uh, uh, earlier papers, have been um, uh, ages, uh, uh, construction workers because of hard physical work, uh, workers burn out, construction workers burn out, uh, and they do so at a younger age, and they leave the workforce. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in fact, it's a little bit of a, a, a statistics problem because you'll, you'll have people who uh, will change professions. They'll go from uh, being a construction worker to something else that's less strenuous. And then when the diseases or, or illnesses happen uh, later in life, uh, then it becomes well, the current occupation and not accounting for earlier occupation. So it's very difficult to sort of try to, 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 to stretch over uh, a, working, a person's working life. And, and uh, uh, th so many, I, I think that helps, uh, uh, contributes to the under-reporting sometimes in, uh, for construction workers. It, it, dis it disappears. But even then, uh, as you've seen in, s in some s earlier uh, uh, presentations, uh, older workers are, are at a are greater risk. Um, so uh, uh, I think these are, are, are fairly, uh, these are just the things I'd like to, to sort of like think of, have you think about. Uh, 
terms of, and, and again, I guess it's in terms of policy. Now, this, the, the bottom of this, uh, for your, those of you that may not be able to, to uh, see it, it's a, a personnel person asking a new employee prospect, uh, what are we looking for? We are looking for is someone about 25 years old with 40 years of experience. And uh, part of this is, is because employment employers don't like to pay for older, uh, for health care and, uh, and pet insurance and things like that. So they'll look for uh, younger workers. And, and this leads to one of the difficulties or confounders, I think, for thinking about older workers is age discrimination. And I think that's a, a very real risk. And uh, one has to be very careful about um, controlling or prevention because you don't want to have uh, older workers who are perfectly capable of working uh, being discriminated against in uh, employment. This is a, from the US uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, and it shows the labor needs projected over time up to 2030. Uh, and the labor that will be uh, available uh, in our current system. In our current system, uh, people can retire at age 62 in the US. Uh, I think that age will, will, will increase, the retirement age will uh, increase because uh, of the shifting proportion of the younger workers need to support the, the, the system. Uh, and then um, this will continue in the, in the future uh, and we'll continue to see a, an increase in uh, people over 55 in, the, in proportion to the, the younger workers. Uh, this is uh, in a global perspective to show how uh, on the left is Mexico and their, their growth. Uh, and this is comparing cohorts between uh, 1970 and 2010 and projected into the future from 2010 to 2050. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, we're going to have the working age population is, is decreasing, which means fewer people globally help support a system that's based uh, on younger workers, uh, supporting older workers. <coughs> Oops, I gotta go back. thing about older workers having more difficult learning uh, new technologies. <coughs> so in two, year 2000, we have a fairly young world. I don't think these colors will show up or not. And you can see uh, distributions of uh, age uh, over 60 in the year 2000. But by year 2025, we're going to see a, uh, quite an increase in, uh, in, in the uh, folks over 60. And why is this sudden boom in life expectancy from birth? Well, part of it is uh, there's a dramatic birth rate drop in birth rates. Uh, this is again uh, from a number of countries, uh, ranging from the US on the left and all the way to uh, China and India on the right. And, and again, we're I've lost something else in the left there, but, uh, but it, and also, uh, the definition of retirement. Um, I was trying to get a picture of Dr. Kresge 
here, but uh, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but uh, this is all of these factors are going to affect the way we, uh, we we think about retirement. And I think what one thing will mean is is that there's a good chance that people will have to work longer. And uh, that's that's something that we should think about in our, our policy development. Now I'd like to think a little bit about the uh, work-relatedness of, of uh, aging workforce. And as uh, you can see, do, uh, when we think about the cost of, of aging, uh, and, and this is this is from our Medicare system, and this covers really people who are over 65 over time, from uh, 1992 to 2004. Uh, and you can see that the trends are all going up. Cost care, cost of health care increases, not only with age, and, and exponentially from 65 to 74. And by the time one is, that's like double for when you get to 85 and over. But that the trend is going up with, with time. And what, if we could find a way, of many ways, of, uh, but one way being of occupational safety and health, of reducing uh, injuries and illnesses in the, in the older cohorts, then we can maybe help reduce the cost of, uh, of, of uh, aging. Of, of, of serving an aging population. Now I'd like to talk about uh, older construction workers as a particular example. And uh, not just uh, acute disease, but chronic conditions. And uh, this may be as a future that we, we see in construction uh, as a, with, a, with an older workforce. Now you take, we've already heard some um, fatality data, uh, but, but here's some other uh, ways of presenting the same kinds of information. And this is, uh, comes to me from uh, Dr. Sue Dong from the Center to Protect Workers' Rights, uh, who uh, is a statistician there and has done an excellent job of uh, trying to tease out the data that I, uh, our colleague from the health department here, health ministry here, asking about before, uh, and it is difficult to, to find. She's used multiple sources to come to these, uh, these summaries of data. Uh, but construction, you can see, is uh, uh, higher than other industries by all age groups, but particularly in the U.S. to try to re re pay attention to reducing fatalities from falls, uh, from heights. That uh, uh, there's all sorts of factors in, involved that, 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 that and I think George pointed those, those out, many of those out in his, his pre presentation. And as did uh, Anders with his presentation on hearing, he had uh, some data in there about uh, hearing changes. Uh, and, and this is age distributions and uh, uh, for all, compared to all, in construction compared to all industry, and clearly is uh, with aging, Hearing loss becomes a particular problem, as does vision in the same kind of way, and hypertension. And what kinds of research do we need to uh, to uh, address these problems? Uh, well, our National Research Council study, uh, which I helps inform this talk, uh, the, the the report. Uh, that we have to uh, try to emphasize aging produ productively in a positive way and keep people uh, who are aged healthier uh, versus trying to think about age as a status uh, category. Uh, we should begin, begin looking at these things earlier and not waiting them to be, in, in, you know, try to understand where how age really relatedness uh, relates to work relatedness. And we should look at uh, risk factors that should be addressed in the earlier years 
uh, to keep people working healthier. Uh, and we'd like to promote change research to capture uh, precursors that may, uh, may uh, affect uh, age-related changes. It's a, aging is a balance of things uh, because uh, as agers, one of, the, one of the things about retirement uh, is that uh, there are some people who would really like to work longer. They enjoy work. They uh, want to just want to keep going again. And Dr. Kresge is a perfect example of this. Uh, and and, and uh, is someone who's, who's uh, really engaged in, in their work and their life. Uh, and uh, they have to, uh, but meanwhile, uh, there are other workers who in retirement uh, have to work longer, I mean, partly because of things like our, our current fis fiscal crisis and uh, that uh, all of a sudden there's challenges to social in in uh, retirement systems and social insurance. And uh, I, I expect we'll see uh, more people working, having to work longer. And I think then that becomes a challenge for us as uh, health and safety professionals to, uh, to, uh, to address. But aging can be very, uh, uh, I think we should think of it in a positive kind of way, try to control the, the health care costs. And, uh, but we should be aware that uh, in, in health care costs, that uh, aging is less of a factor than many other uh, risk factors, uh, smoking, obesity, et cetera, and that we really can find a way of, uh, if you're creative, of, uh, of figuring out how to age productively, or as we'd like to say, healthy age. So to get to that, uh, we need to uh, think about longitudinal studies for older, older workers, uh, what's the impact of risk. And all of this in the context of preventing discrimination, because age discrimination, I think, is a, a really serious problem. Uh, and there are surveys that uh, are being put together. Uh, our Bureau of Labor Statistics is trying to include age and in, in, in along with other factors to, uh, to try to understand uh, what, what's going on there. Uh, and uh, our National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health and Occupational Safety and Health Administration are, are looking at ways, uh, ways of, of kind of understanding uh, how health and safety is involved with, uh, with aging. And by way of summary, I'd just say, like, to say that all of us are aging, and, uh, but, uh, but those that are older continue to grow as a proportion of the working population populations and that we, uh, uh, that has an effect that's outside of the uh, 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 plans that, that, that current social policies uh, have allowed for. And uh, as the available work population changes, many employers have jobs for which they want to attract and retain more experienced workers. Uh, and that's the positive side. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, construction or skilled workers are, uh, are, are valued and retired workers are called upon to come back uh, because of their skills. Uh, workers are living longer than ever before and many are staying in the workforce past age 55. Some will work longer because they wish to, more because they must. The current economic crisis puts continuing pressure on workers' families and their retirement plans. Retirements are likely to be po postponed. Consequence of injuries are on average more severe for older workers than younger workers and require more days away from work to recover. Uh, deaths resulting from work-related injuries occurs at higher rates among older workers than younger workers. Uh, current knowledge about keeping workers safe and health, healthy at work is insufficient. Yet enough is known to mount campaigns to improve protections to support the health and well-being of current and growing number of aging workers. And we, most importantly, I think we must guard against age-related workplace discrimination. And I'll leave you with my data sources. 
uh, and these data sources continue to, to grow and I hope that they can help you. Thank you. Let's uh, thank our panel again one more time. They did a great job. Thank you. And I would like to thank the, our translators uh, who agreed generously to translate until the end of the talk. Thank you. But from now, I will volunteer. If there are questions, I will translate. So thank you. Come hard, Chris. Come hard, come comment. Shot Snora Kauchun, Petakish Zetichnevi, Yev Tavalneri Hamar. I sent Rosh Lav Kalinesh Nara Volchun Linesh, Haika Kanko Mel Ish Ureman Zekuitsner and Erkasnel. Սակայն փոքրիկա կուզենայի տեղեկություն, որ որտեղ երևի փորձի առումով կարելի է նաև հայկական կողմի համակարգային մոտեցումները ունենալ։ Thank you very much for the interesting talks. And um, Dr. Avetisyan wishes that we had more Armenian speakers who could present our experience. Uh, but she thinks that she could make a comment very briefly about what we do in Armenia. Uh, In the past, we have had lots of activities in occupational health and safety, and now we continue some scientific work in this area. Ուրեմն շատ կարևոր է այսօր այն պահանջները, որոնք պետք է ապահովեն աշխատողների հիվանդությունը, մասնագիտական հիվանդությունների ձերկ բերման կանխարգելման հարցերը դրանք մեծ մասամբ օրենսդրական կարգավորման կարիք ունեն։ Most of the requirements that would regulate the workplace safety issues and occupational health issues would need a legislative basis. In Shumai Khantire, where of it can't shut but it, Khortain Tarinevis Heto, Het Khortain Jamana Knerim, Orange Drutsuna, Bavakan, Met Jech Kvatskunet, Met Batara Chatsav, Yev Oren Knedi, Yevian Taurens Drakan Akteri Makardakum. During the post-Soviet times, we lost many of the regulations, so we develop a big gap in these regulations. Uh, for example, we have the amendment of the new constitution and that states that uh, obligations or responsibilities should be regulated by laws only. Uh, Hanrain Arochan Ureman uh 
ապահովման մասին Հայաստանի Հանրապետության օրենքը նախագիծ օրենքը Developing and adopting laws is a very long process. For example, for the last several years we have developed the draft law on public health in Armenia. Այդ օրենքով մենք ամբողջությամբ փորձեցինք ոլորտը կանխարգելիչ ուրեմն այս առողջապահության ոլորտը եւ բնակության սայն տարահամաճարակային անվտանգության ոլորտը բերել ժամանակակից միջազգային մոտեցումների մակարդակի In the draft law we tried to have regulations that would bring our norms and standards um, along with the internationally accepted standards on environmental health, occupational health, etc. and public health. Երբ այդ օրենքը կընդունվի, ապա մենք մի շարք ոլորտներում կունենանք կանոնակարգված հարաբերություններ։ When this law is adopted, then we are going to have much better regulated relationships between different institutions. Բայց այս ընթացքում մենք փորձել ենք բազմաթիվ ենթաօրենսդրական իրավական ակտերով ինչքանով դա հնարավոր է տարբեր հարցեր կանոնակարգել we try to fill the gap in the legislation having different uh, legal uh, acts and orders to try to regulate these relationships between different institutions եթե օրինակը աշխատողների առողջական վիճակի հսկողությունը եւ օրենսդրորը նկարկավորված եւ իրականացվում է ապա մենք խնդիրներ ունենք կապված այլ տեսակետների հետ մասնավորապես եթե մենք փորձում ենք տրավմատիզմի այսօր համաճարակաբանական հսկողության համակարգը վերել միջազգային մակարդակի փորձել դա ձևավորել դրան համապատասխան ապա խնդիրներ ունենք կապված եւ աշխատողների եւ պաշտոնական գրանցումների հետ եւ նրանց դիմելիության հետ եւ այս ոլորտում հսկողության ահագին մեծ աշխատանք կա իրականացնելու For example when they are trying to implement an injury surveillance system they are facing lots of difficulties and barriers as some of you already mentioned that sometimes uh, the employees are not in the legal sector and there is lack of reporting and it's very difficult to get the reliable information բայց կխնդրեմ այն առաջին մասն ընթացքանք որ բուժ այս աշխատող անձանց դժկական հսկողությունը եւ իրա իրավական հիմքերը ունի եւ դա իրականացվում է պարբերաբար Okay so the occupational health related issues needs its legal basis and they are working hard right now to fulfill those uh, responsibilities in the Ministry of Health Այսինքն այսպես երկու տարբեր բևեռներ են առաջանում, որոնք պետք է կանոնակարգվեն եւ դրանք ժամանակ է պետք որպեսի դրանք ուրեմն այսպես համահունչ եւ ինտեգրացված ընթանան։ Եվ մեծ աշխատանք է այստեղ, որովհետեւ ոլորտը կապված է եւ ուրեմն սոցիալական խնդիրների եւ առողջապահական խնդիրների եւ քաղաքաշինական խնդիրների եւ տարբեր տարբեր ոլորտներում աշխատողների իրավունքների պարտականությունների եւ բազմաթիվ հարցերի հետ մալտիդիսցիպլինարի իշյու բիկոզ իտս հելթ իշյու իտս օկուպացիոնալ հելթ իշյու իտս կոնստրակշնս ռիլեյտեդ իշյու սո մալտիպլ պարտիս շուդ գետ ինվոլվ ին ռեգուլեյտինգ դիս էրիա բարձրացված հարցերը որ այստեղ ուրեմն արծածվեցին շատ կարևոր են եւ ռիսկի գործոնները եւ նրանց դիտարկման ձևերը իհարկե հայտնի են եւ կիրառվում են բայց էլ եմ ասում կան մի շարք իրավական օրենսդրական բացեր որոնք կանոնակարգելու պարագայում դրանք կլինեն համակարգային եւ համապարփակ այսքան բոլոր ոլորտները միասին աշխատելու պայմաններում են կարող են ունենալ լուրջ հսկողություն այս առումով 
you talked about risk factors and about surveillance system for those risk factors. You also mentioned surveys. And all of this to be regulated and be integrated, we would need a strong legal basis so that we can make sure that all the parties comply with the regulations. Yes, we saw when volume goes and cash near a cow and Avali Mandra Masson, Nerkas, Nelzut, Ashaton, Yaro, Chucham Volorda. Yes, Volpes Hamajara Gabon, Bavakan Hetak, Krivats, Nerkats, Hastagal Nero. Yes, Kartumen, Vor Arit Kalini, Mekan Kamel, Hastani Porter, Tesnel, Vetes Daevas. Okay. As an epidemiologist, this was a very interesting symposium for me, and it was interesting to listen uh, your talks. It would be nice if you had also an opportunity to absorb what we do and how we do it in Armenia. And Lili Pieta Tuil Katak, yes, Kuvena Yavalax Nelievas Mek Hangamank, Vorimas in Chimeshwek, Bachat Karevore, Hanra and Arokta Parutan Hamar, Shatkich. Միջոցներ <imitation> 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 <imitation>
Thank you. And they have some questions. Հանրում <laughs> Հանրային առողջության խնդիրները չեն լուծում, այսինքն շրջակա միջավայրի ազդեցությունը հանրային առողջության վրա կապը ինչպես ինքն արան դատ կրկնում պատճառահետևանքային կապի եւ այլ եւ այլ չկա արդյունքներ չկան եւ այս իմանալով գոն է համաճարակաբանության ոլորտում ինչպես ինպես հաջողություններ ա ունեցալ Աստանը ես ուզում եմ խնդրեմ մի քանի ուղակի նախադասությունով ներկայացնեք որ կներով կան մի քանի նախադասությունով ներկայացնեք Uh, so he referred to the presentation from yesterday that Artur Grigorian, the lawyer, when he presented about the legal gap analysis, that he mentioned that uh, nothing is being done in the public health area or connecting the environmental pollution with the health effects. And he, uh, he requested that uh, Dr. Avetisian says a few words about that. Uh, մի <laughs> Այո մեր գործող օրենս դրությունը թարմացնելու եւ միջազգային ուրեմոտեցումներին համահոր դարձնելու խնդիր ունենք։ Մեր օրենքը 92 թվականին է ընդունվել եւ եթե այսօր գործում է ուրեմն ինքը բանվական լավ օրենք է եղել, բայց արդենքանի տարի է մենք նախագիծ ենք նոր պատրաստել ինչպես ասացի որ փոխվի։ I wasn't here, so I don't know what exactly he said, but from what you are uh, telling me, I should just say maybe that he didn't explore the area very well. Uh, Dr. Avetisian mentioned that we have gaps in our regulations and we are working on them to improve them. We have the draft law, which will try to take care of the issues that we're facing because we have a very old law that has short, uh, shortcomings apparently, but it was developed in 1992 and until now it works. So it was a good one when it was developed that it's working until now, but we understand that it has issues. Ուրեմ ինչ վերաբերում է հանրային առողջապահության ոլորտում աշխատանքներ չկատարելուն, ասեմ, որ մի անշանակ համաձայն չեմ, որովհետև այս ոլորտում հսկայացավալ աշխատանք է կատարվում։ Ես ինչպես ասացի, ոչ վարակիչ հիվանդների համաճարակաբանությունը դա նոր կատեգորիա է մեր համար։ Խորհրդային դպրոցը չուներ այս հասկացությունը եւ մենք չենք անցել այս համաճարակաբանությունը։ Սա վերջին տարիներին ներդրվեց որպես կատեգորիա եւ հիմա բավական զարգացել է։ Ուրեմն Okay, she mentioned that um, to say that we're doing nothing in public health will be untrue because we're doing a lot. And she already mentioned about a weakness that the system was developed for infectious disease control. And we were not studying at the time how to deal with non-infectious diseases uh, or non-communicable diseases. And that's why our system is weak in this area but it doesn't mean that we are wor not working on the public health area. And um, Lilijanis, <laughs> 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 Եվ դա դեռ շարունակվել շարունակվելու է եւ ես հուսով եմ որ մի քանի տարի հետո 
մենք ունենանք այնպիսի զարգացումներ, որ համահունչ կդառնանք եւ մեր տվյալները համեմատելի կդառնան այլ երկրների տվյալների հետ։ We have started to work on injury control, uh, tobacco control uh, and one more. Traumatism uh, I mentioned it. Ah, yeah. uh, uh, and we are working on the systems, we are improving them and we are hoping that in a couple of years we will have a good strong system and we will produce data that is com uh, internationally comparable. Ayo gutsem mej hnaravorutsun mere michazgain gitajrogovnerin masnakselu michazgain portsi het shptelu aitkan mets chen bats menk portsu menk arite bats chtornel եւ ամեն անգամ որևէ օգուտ խաղել նման ուրեմն գիտաժողովներից հանդիպումներից եւ այդ ստացած գիտելիքները եւս կիրառել մեր համակարգի զարգացման գործ Unfortunately the opportunities for uh, internationally organized capacity development are not big uh, but we have some opportunities and it is wonderful to have this symposium where we can uh, hear about the international experience Ես չգիտեմ պատասխանեցի իմ կոլեգայի հարցին մեջ է, բայց շնորհակալություն։ Շնորհակալություն։ Դոկտոր Ավեկիսյան։ Thank you very much everyone. I will be bilingual. <laughs> Uh, we have to conclude our symposium. We're again behind our schedule. I apologize for that. Uh, but I would like uh, Dr. Miranda Sofriti to say a few concluding words. Thank you. Just, just a few uh, words. A uh, few words. Uh, first, uh, to thank everybody for the who organized this uh, uh, excellent uh, symposium. And then uh, I wish to thank also uh, the fellows who came uh, uh, from all around the world. Uh, to present uh, their experience uh, in this symposium. And then I wish to thank also the fellows who came from uh, we had uh, the opportunity to review several uh, risky situation, uh, environmental risky situation, and also the effect of the risk for uh, our health. Մենք նա այսինք տարբեր իրավիճակների, տարբեր ռիսկի գործոններ վերլուծեցինք։ We investigated, uh, we are able to investigate now on the effect of uh, past risks for our health. Մենք նաև նա այսինք, որ անցալին եղած ռիսկերը ինչպես են ազդում առողջության վրա։ We had uh, excellent review by um, by Kurt uh, from IARC uh, uh, reviewing uh, uh, all the agent uh, and all the situation for cancer risk. IARC investigated on more almost uh, 1,000 uh, agents, uh, chemical or uh, physical. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, found uh, that more than 100 uh, uh, agents are carcinogenic for uh, humans. But uh, 
most uh, of that agents are produced uh, to uh, from uh, 10 uh, um, uh, 10 million to 30 40 million tons a year several of them uh, are persistent in our environment uh, like uh, asbestos uh, like polychlorinated biphenol or uh, polychlorinated biphenols uh, Dr. And uh, epidemiological studies are measuring the effect of uh, the exposure to such a compounds. The result uh, of this study give uh, the measure of uh, the uh, chronic effect uh, of uh, exposure to these agents, uh, in particular cancer and other chronic diseases. So all this knowledge alert us uh, to me in uh, two aspects. One, it is uh, that uh, we have a lot to do to reduce uh, exposure of people to uh, this type of uh, risky agents. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, to go in uh, deeper to the other major agents and compounds which are exposed uh, and uh, of what uh, we do know nothing yet uh, or mm -hmm. a little. Uh, and in particular, uh, we must be alert that uh, uh, for the future and the we are uh, going in uh, the future, uh, we cannot uh, uh, have uh, make uh, the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. We have to use all the tools we have uh, now available, and we have several tools available to predict uh, the potential risk of uh, the new, for instance, new material, mm -hmm. new uh, risky situation. And to take in consideration the results of such a predictive uh, uh, test laboratory, laboratory test uh, and not uh, to await 20, 30, 40 years mm -hmm. uh, to make uh, judgment. To do that, uh, to do that, we need resources. We need resources to do research, and to do research to predict the risk. Finally, we learn uh, other things uh, that uh, our, the quality of our life, uh, particularly the quality of life uh, of the years uh, which we gain uh, getting older. Verchapes Kanivormink Nayev Teramimink, Kanki Vurak Shatkarevore depend uh, a lot uh, from the life uh, we had uh, we we had uh, during prenatal life uh, during adolescence life uh, and we this is means uh, how lot we have to do to avoid uh, the consequence of uh, exposure in early life uh, in the old uh, part of our life yeah. Uh, 
we must uh, take, uh, uh, of course, in uh, consideration that, uh, uh, as it has been uh, 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 deeply uh, presented this uh, afternoon, that uh, uh, work, uh, several works uh, which uh, we uh, performed during uh, uh, young life have uh, uh, consequences uh, in uh, uh, the uh, uh, starting at, uh, at 55, uh, 60 years of age. So we have to take in consideration that work when we are suggesting, when, when we are suggesting that uh, um, our life uh, activity must uh, prolong after 65 or 70 years uh, of age. Kani vod kanki te vogutsu ne yev karun e yev gutsu ne ne tor hekaz gutsu ne rita vial ne re petke okta gortsen vod pesi avli lav has kana che inch pes avli lav kanki vod ak avli lavat men. So I want to conclude saying that uh, the problem we had uh, 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 we had uh, um, uh, deal with. Uh, in this uh, symposium, our problem uh, not uh, only of Armenia, but all uh, the uh, general population in uh, our uh, planet. Uh, and so uh, we have to be uh, linked all together, different uh, geographic area of the world, and Collegium Ramazzini is uh, an excellent network uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. Because the voice of independent science and independent scientist must uh, arise uh, very uh, speedily. And uh, Ramazzini Collegium is uh, an independent uh, uh, network of uh, scientists uh, which want to have the freedom to speak uh, loudly. Ankah Gitna Kaneri, Evankah Gitutian Zaina Petke Barkerlini, Yev Collegium Ramazzini, Ankah Gitna Kaneri, Uremen Hamunke. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Dr. Sofriti said it all, and he kind of uh, put together what we have covered in these two days. And I think I would like to conclude with a list of thank yous, because many people worked on this idea, and without their support, we wouldn't be able to do this project. So first of all, thank you, Collegium Ramazzini, as the organization and its fellows for contribution of their time and their resources for making this symposium to happen. I would like to specially thank you, Benny Dobin and Margaret von Braun, who were in the organizing committee and who helped a lot to put this symposium together. Thank you. I would like to thank also the students of the Master of Public Health program who volunteered and who tried to help and support us. The staff, researchers, and faculty of the School of Public Health, but I want to highlight a few names. Serine, Mary, Ruzana, and Vahe, thank you very much. You solved all our problems, thank you. Akopian Center for the Environment, uh, particularly Alain Amirkhanyan and Karen Arbadan helped a lot. And of course, AUA administration has been very supportive for organizing this symposium and hosting it at AUA. And thank you to the support staff who have been helping us a lot with all sorts of issues from lighting to recording uh, today's symposium. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much to the organizations that co-sponsored uh, our symposium. Those include World Health Organization, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, uh, National Institute of Health USA, 
Terra Graphics International Foundation, Blacksmith Institute, and Counterpart International, which is a USAID supported project. And thanks to everyone who attended our symposium. We are hoping that this was a good discussion. We can develop ideas for future collaboration and future meetings. And thank you for coming and being with us. Եվ զուտ հրճակագրային բնութին նոր, որ այս աստայ սորենքի 
Ինչ 